G'day internet, welcome back to another video. The eMac, hmm. If there's ever a machine from the Apple family that tends to show up at e-waste recyclers, sitting by the curb waiting for the hard rubbish, I hate to say it, but it's generally the eMac. But the question is why? Why do people legitimately struggle to give these away? And I'm not kidding. This particular machine came from an ad on Facebook Marketplace locally. They were giving this away and a bunch of other stuff. So I went and I picked it up. It was free. But then a couple of days later, I got a message from the guy. Hey, you know that second eMac that was sitting there? Yeah. Do you want it too? Nobody else wants it. So now I have two eMacs, the other one's sitting on a shelf just up there. So what is it about these machines? On paper, they don't seem too bad for the era that they came from. We've got a reasonable G4 processor. The RAM is upgradable. So is the hard drive, which are actually two things that we're gonna cover in this video. The only real issue that I can see is the fact that it's quite large and very heavy. Maybe that's what turns people off or the fact that it came out at the same time as the eye lamp. Yes, that really funky bulbous based uh, Apple Mac with the arm and the LCD screen. It was cool, no doubt about it. And so I think the old eMac just kind of got forgotten about. In the end, it was just an education based cheap Mac. At the time, the CRTs were cheaper to make than the LCD screens on the eye lamp. Also, I think at the time, people weren't sure how well an LCD screen would survive in the educational environment. But the eMac had quite the turbulent life. Initially, when it was bought out, it was purely for education markets. Only schools could buy it directly from Apple. It was then released uh, to retail for a couple of versions of this machine. Uh, and then in the end, it was turned back to education only. So I don't know, maybe because Apple didn't exactly make it easy for an average Joe in the street to get their hands on one of these machines, people just went and bought something else. But because it was an education machine and the schools were full of them, there's a million of them out there. And from what I can tell, they're fairly robust. So in this video, like I said, we're gonna throw some upgrades at it. We're also then gonna have a bit of a play with the machine and see what fun we can have. So let's tear the old girl down. Now, even back in the day, these weren't really known for their serviceability. It's not like a Power Mac where you flip down the side and you can have your evil ways with the computer. These aren't difficult, they're just involved when it comes to tearing them down. So the first thing I'm gonna want is a towel on the bench to protect that beautiful CRT. The other thing is they're really heavy. Yeah. The first steps are actually pretty simple. Uh, there's some Allen keys around the top and the sides uh, and two uh, Phillips head screws round the back. So with all those screws out uh, and the memory cover removed as well, this should just lift up, but there is a wire that goes to this power button. So we need to be careful. This should just come up uh, and in here, there we go. It's only a tiny little plug and the inside of our eMac. Now, before we go any further, warnings. There are sparky things back here. Be careful, if you're not comfortable in doing this, don't. But next up is this shield here, uh, which is four screws. Uh, 
And there's one, two, three clips, which can be quite stiff. There we go. And there's actually two clips in underneath here. Um, so it does require a slight push down uh, and then it should just come out. Next is to get the fan out of the way. Um, you don't actually need to remove the fan from the bracket, but there's one, two, three, four, five screws. Now remember the screws around here are the ones with the tapping thread, not the machine thread. So when you go to reassemble, Uh, disconnect the fan and this should just come out and we can basically just flop that to the side. Next undo the video connector which is just here. Now this has got clips on either side of it uh, and one of them is really close to a capacitor so just be careful but that just flops out of the way as well. Uh, the lead for that power button just unclip from up here and let that dangle. Under this corner here, there is five cables that need disconnecting. Four cables that need disconnecting, sorry. Next, it's just a matter of taking out a whole stack of screws around the outside. Uh, I like to use one of my long screwdrivers for this. And then this whole thing should just come out. And these two screws are the ones why I grab my long screwdriver. Now, assuming I've got all the screws out, this should just lift away. And it does. And here is the main logic board out of our eMac. We've got a full-size optical drive here and our hard drive is actually tucked way up here. And this is kind of the reason why you need to tear it right down. Uh, we're gonna be replacing this hard drive with uh, this 250 gig uh, Samsung SSD. And in theory, this should just drop straight in there. Um, the reason I'm using this drive is if memory serves me right, it's actually already got a running copy of OS X Tiger on it and a bunch of stuff. So either it will, or I'll be spending a day loading up software. To get the hard drive out, disconnect the power initially. Um, there is, depending on how you've disassembled, there's a screw here and a screw back here. If you can't see, trust me, they're hard to miss. This whole caddy should then lift out and it's sliced up IDE cable should just disconnect. There you go. The next bit isn't rocket science, four screws. Carefully lift the drive out of its caddy uh, and disconnect the IDE cable. Here's our SSD in a 3D printed uh, little chassis. I'll put a link down in the description. It's just one I found on Thingiverse. Um, plug the IDE cable in first. And if I haven't completely screwed this up, this should drop right in. And we hopefully can reuse the screws from the hard drive. Just needs a little bit of pressure to uh, get those screws to bite into the 3D print. And only after a little bit of swearing, I got it in. Back to where we started, IDE cable in.
get the chassis in place where it wants to sit and hook the power connector up to the original power. So before we put this together, a quick note, I've gotten to the point where I will only now use the StarTech IDE to SATA adapters. Um, I've just found them more reliable than some of the rubbish on eBay, uh, so that's why I use these. Another quick note is the original hard drive was set to uh, cable select, um, so I've set this to cable select as well. So is that done? It, this should just be a case of putting this back in from whence it came. Uh, there is two locating lugs just here that line up to some holes on the chassis. Um, hopefully, I can get this to line up. You'll know you're pretty close because none of the screws will line up otherwise. Now, as much as this is doable with the whole machine assembled, it's way easier to swap the RAM and the battery now, as opposed to the tiny little opening you get in the outer shell. So, if I remember correctly, this has got two, uh, 700 and something meg of RAM. The Emacs are rated to one gig, but it turns out they will quite happily take two. Done. Uh, don't forget to plug the video cable back in. Hook up the power lead out of its way again. Uh, and we should be able to bring in that rear shield. Now, just quickly, uh, these are these two hooks I mentioned, there and there. And they need to go up into slots here and here but it's not too hard, but it's worthwhile getting those seated first. He says as he struggles, right, they're in, and then push the three clips into place. Cool. Next, fan. and the four screws into the outer shield. And that pretty much does it. We can just drop the cover back on, not forgetting that power cable. Before we move on to the last couple of things I want to do to this machine before we actually start playing with it is I want to give this thing a bit of a clean up. You might be able to actually see the state of the screen uh, and it's covered in like old sticker marks and stuff like that. So clean time.
There is simply something about the human nail that is perfect. I've yet to find something artificial that can do as good a job of scratching crap off as the human nail. The next thing I want to do to this machine is purely for aesthetics, but personally, I think it makes a big difference. And that is this, the proper stand that goes underneath the machine. This just looks like a computer box something. This, I think, really gives the computer some presence on the desk. Tell me that just doesn't look better. The last thing I want to do to this machine is add this. This is the Airport Extreme card, and it actually goes in near the CD-ROM. But to do that, you need to have the machine turned off, but with the CD-ROM open. And there's legitimately, far as I can tell, only one way of doing that. What we need to do is hold the door flap open, have something small handy. Power on the machine, reach in, hit the eject button and literally pull the power. I don't like pulling power on a computer that's running, but that seems to be the go. Now, hopefully you can see this, but there is two screws either side. They need to come out and this little black cover comes with it. Now, these are luckily captive screws. So that comes out and you'll see our little uh, antenna clipped inside. This goes in label down. So we put it into its little slot. And if I remember correctly, the trick is to plug the antenna lead in now and then push it home, which is sometimes easier said than done. Right. And that should be it. No. There we go, it's got a nice little thunk at the end. So with all that done, let's power it on for real. Assuming I can find the power button. The antenna lead for the... Uh, airport card was in the way. There we go. It booted. Now, I need to switch cameras so you don't have to put up with this. So with all those upgrades thrown at the mighty EMAC, what can we do with it? Well, it turns out that a bunch of my favorite games, mainly first person shooters, uh, from the late 90s and early 2000s, were released for Mac. I didn't realize. So there's a whole bunch of stuff from like, Unreal Tournament and Quake and things like that that will happily run on this machine, especially because we're running Tiger, so we have that classic environment as well. There's also some slightly more modern shenanigans that we can get up to. So let's start by taking a look at what we've actually got. So if we open up about this Mac, you can see we've got a 1.25 gigahertz G4. We've got our two gig of RAM. Uh, and if I open up System Profiler and go to Graphics, uh, we've got our ATI, it says an RV280, uh, but that is the Radeon 9200. So where do we start? Well, how about we start with some Unreal Tournament?
And if I spin up a quick one-on-one -on -one death match, uh, we can also bring up our frames per second. And we're sitting on kind of the 45, 50-ish frames per second, which is not too bad considering this is, well, it's essentially running in emulation. Um, now, I know the classic environment isn't emulation exactly, but there is a whole other level there that this is running on top of. Now, of course, you can't talk first-person shooters from the early 2000s without talking about Quake 3. And again, with a quick death match and bring up our frames per second, it's sitting on a solid 90. Come back here. How long has it been since I've played this? And if we want to, we can even step all the way up to UT2K4 and it will happily sit on that looks like, you know, the 50-ish frames per second mark. We really need to set up a online UT2K4 server purely so, I don't know, maybe YouTubers and Patreons or something can jump on because this is a hell of a lot of fun with a stack of people in it. As opposed to now where I can't, you know, find anyone. But it's not just all 20 year old first person shooters. If you watched Action Retro's video uh, recently, he's been playing around with Classy Cube, which is a modern rewrite for old computers of Minecraft. And I've actually been in here for the last couple of days and it plays great. As you can see, I've been here before and I'm getting a solid 55, 57 frames per second. Oh. Steve Jobs is here. Look at that. Hello, Steve. So there we go, the eMac. We uh, threw some upgrades at it. We had some fun, both with some classic first-person shooters uh, and a little bit of a dabble in modern Minecraft. And all in all, it stood up to all the tasks I threw at it. So where does that leave me with the eMac? Does it deserve the reputation of constantly showing up at e-waste recyclers? Honestly, no. So somewhere between free and dirt cheap, you end up with a machine that's got a reasonably powerful G4 in it, easy to throw RAM and a bit of work to put a modern hard drive in, and that absolutely glorious 17-inch CRT. So if you've ever had the inkling of wanting to play with this era of OS X, maybe have a bit of a play in the classic environment, enjoy the games that uh, I showed you today, given that, like I said, people struggle to give these away, I just don't think you can do any better. And I'll go back to it again, playing those first person shooters at quite a healthy frame rate on this CRT just can't be beaten, at least not with any other all-in-one Macintosh from this era. So I hope you found that video useful, interesting, maybe even a little entertaining. Let me know down in the comments what your experiences are with the eMac. Maybe you had one at school. Maybe this actually is your favourite Mac. Maybe it's also your least favourite. I don't know. But if you enjoyed the video, click like, subscribe, all the usual YouTube-y stuff. 
As always, a massive shout out to my patrons who are scrolling up the screen as I speak. And if you'd like to help out the channel, there is a link in the description. But until then, I'll see you in the next one. Well played, Sean. Well played.